All right. Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to Open Dialogue. I know that, uh, please get comfortable, and uh, hopefully everyone has their sandwiches and snacks. Um, the Open Dialogue is, we're talking about local research with global impact. My name is Brian Thompson, and I'm the CEO of the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation. First, I'd like to acknowledge that Dalhousie University is located on, in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, where all treaty people. Today, we're here to talk about health research and the incredible impact it can have locally and around the globe. More importantly, we're here to talk about the outstanding research taking place right here at Dalhousie's Faculty of Health, Dentistry and Medicine. Health is key to an improved quality of life and health research is improving, proving, uh, providing us with solutions to the conditions and diseases that impact each of us. Prevention, faster diagnosis, better treatments and ultimately cures are the outcomes of health research excellence. The Nova Scotia health research ecosystem is really going through a major paradigm shift. A more collaborative approach to improving health outcomes is quickly becoming the new reality. Health research in Nova Scotia is leading the way by staying at the forefront of innovation. We're applying new strategies and techniques that address some of the most pressing health issues locally with impact that spans the globe, as you'll certainly hear from our researchers today. The foundation itself was founded 40 years ago in 1979 by the dean at the time, Dean Hatcher, and a group of private citizens who realized that there wasn't enough funding happening from both a public and private perspective to fund health medical uh, research in the area. We envision a collaborative environment where research helps prevent the onset of severe mental illness, immunotherapies that teach our immune system to fight cancer, evidence-based initiatives that help our children become healthy and active. Crucial research data is accessible on a broader scale, cutting edge biomaterial technologies, advanced treatment outcomes, and our body's ability to regenerate. And accurate Alzheimer's diagnosis leads to timely interventions. Just some of the major initiatives that are taking place right here at Dalhousie. Today, you'll have the opportunity to hear from researchers who are leaders in these trailblazing areas. At DMRF, our mandate is to support health-related researchers at Dalhousie by fundraising to provide the best resources available to bolster their leading edge work. And it's working. Dalhousie's Faculty of Medicine, Health, and Dentistry produced pioneering research that is world-renowned and internationally competitive. Together, we are advancing research and improving health. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, a consummate communications professional and the vice chair of our foundation board, Ms. Janet McMillan. Janet is currently serving as interim assistant vice president of communications and marketing for Dalhousie. Janet has devoted much of her professional and board governance career to guiding and supporting successful organizations in their growth trajectories and breakthrough moments. I've witnessed it myself. Um, she serves as lead strategic counsel to some of national public relations Atlantic's Atlantic clients and teams, a firm she co-founded and co-owned. She works with clients in sectors like health, education, resources, renewable and traditional energy, as well as commercial and infrastructure development. Janet is a member of the Institute of Corporate Directors, a fellow and accredited life member of the Canadian Public Relations Society, and is certified by the US-based Institute for Crisis Management and the International Association of Public Participation. Welcome, Janet. Hello, everyone. So as Brian said, I'm Janet McMillan. I'm so pleased to be here today uh, to have an opportunity to introduce and, and uh, moderate this panel. Um, I, for six years, I've been a proud member of the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation Board. And I really, like you, have a very uh, vested interest in health research. Um, because I, I know the difference that health research can make. It saves lives, it improves quality of life, it gives years back to those who have been given a terrifying diagnosis, and it brings comfort um, where there might have been pain. And it's not just about hope, it's about results. It takes these exceptional researchers years of challenging education, time away from personal pursuits, commitment to developing and maintaining an advanced skill set, and of course, it takes a dedicated, compassionate, and curious mind. 
Today, we've invited just a few of Dalhousie's exceptional health researchers to discuss their remarkable research and how it has or how it will impact the health as we know it. As Brian said earlier, health is a key um, part of a good quality of life. It's, it's therefore my pleasure to introduce the members of our esteemed panel who will each be uh, speaking on their research areas of expertise. And afterwards, they will engage in an interactive question period. And I think what I'll do is just introduce every one of them and then get out of the way and let them take over the, take over the day. So first up uh, today to my immediate right, to your far left. Did I get that right? No, to your far right. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, Anyway, Sashi, put, <laughs> yeah, wave, wave. <laughs> Dr. Shashi Gujar. He is an assistant professor of pathology, biology, and microbiology and immunology, as well as a cancer researcher with Dalhousie's Faculty of Medicine. Shashi and his team focus on educating our own immune system to fight cancers. Immunotherapies represent the most promising modern age modalities for the treatment of cancers. And these immunotherapies promote anti-cancer immunity, which not only eliminates existing cancer cells, but also maintains an active surveillance against future cancer relapse. And I've had the pleasure of being in a few presentations and rooms with him, and I just love to hear him talk. Shashi and his team discovered that oncolytic, see, I'm going to get all this wrong, but I've tried, <laughs> viruses known for their cancer-killing properties additionally re-educate the immune system to recognize, attack, and eliminate cancer cells. And indeed, such awakening of the immune system is believed to be key to achieving long-term cancer-free health. Dr. Gujar aims to develop innovative and clinically desired immunotherapies for the prevention and treatment of cancer. So welcome, Shashi. <clears throat> Next, we have Dr. Sarah Kirk. She is a professor of health promotion and the scientific director of the Healthy Populations Institute at Dalhousie University. Sarah's research seeks to understand how we can create supportive environments for chronic disease prevention. Her research uses a socio-ecological approach that takes into account how individual behaviors, behavior is influenced by broader factors, such as income, education, and societal norms. She has led or collaborated on several nationally funded projects that focus on the creation of supportive environments for health promotion in different settings, including in schools. Recently, Sarah and co-lead Dr. Camille hancock Friesen were awarded a $5 million matching grant from the federal government for the Uplift Initiative. And uh, it was widely covered in the news. Some of you may have already heard about this. The announcement took place a couple of weeks ago. Uplift is a partnership designed to build on best practices that already exist in many schools and communities, like the internationally recognized health-promoting schools model. Its components include youth engagement and leadership, systems change, sharing successes and, and evaluating impact. The philosophy, need, and value of Uplift is underpinned by research from Dalhousie's Healthy Populations Institute. Uplift is the first partnership in Nova Scotia to receive funding of this type from the Public Health Agency of Canada. So welcome, Sarah, and congratulations. And now we have Dr. Daniel Boyd. Now, when I met him uh, recently in a Dow Medical Research Foundation board meeting, he was, he was introduced as Dr. Daniel Boyd, but then for the rest of the session, he was called Danny. So I don't know. Are you Danny or Daniel? Danny Either. is it. Okay. <laughs> he is an associate professor of the Department of Applied Oral Sciences, the School of Biomedical Engineering at Dalhousie University, as well as the co-founder of ABK Biomedical. He's a globally recognized inventor of several inorganic polymer technologies in various life science sectors, including orthopedics, dentistry, and oncology. Danny's gained global intellectual property protection for a wide range of inorganic polymers. Daniel, I'll just try the other name, has extensive experience in medical devices and biomaterials. He's centered on bone regeneration and growth, oncology, 
pharma pharmaceutical delivery, and in oral health. He is a co-founder of a number of companies, including ABK Biomedical and IR Scientific, and has governance experience in both public and private sectors. He currently serves as an associate professor in the Faculty of Dentistry at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So welcome, Danny. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Sultan Darvish. Originally from Tanzania, Dr. Sultan Darvish completed a PhD in organic chemistry in 1983 and a postdoctoral fellowship in molecular biology in 1984 at the University of New Brunswick before studying medicine at Dalhousie Medical School and then joining Dalhousie's neurology residency program. Sultan's journey has seen him wearing a multitude of hats neurologist, chemist, professor, assistant dean of research, research associate, co-founder and director of the Maritime Brain Tissue Bank, scientific co-founder of Treventus Corporation, and as the DMRF Irene McDonald Sobe Chair in Curative Approaches to Alzheimer's Disease. All incredibly significant titles but perhaps none as important as his role as a leader in the global efforts to develop a definitive test for Alzheimer's disease during life. For nearly a decade, Dr. Sultan Darvish has been on the hunt for a way to definitively diagnose Alzheimer's disease in people while they are still alive and before their cognitive functions have slipped below the threshold that allows for independence and quality of life. The only way to confirm diagnosis and determine the cause of dementia with certainty is to look at brain tissue under the microscope after death. Dr. Darvish and his team want to change that, and he's here today to talk to us about a recent breakthrough in his research that could make an important difference in treating this devastating disease. So welcome, Sultan. <laughs> So thank you all for joining us today. And at this time, I'm going to invite Dr. Sashi, Shashi Gujar to begin our panel discussion. Shashi, please tell us a bit about your research and what impacts it will have on health, com health outcomes for people locally and for all over the world. Thank you, Janet. Can you guys uh, hear me clear? OK, good. How was lunch? Good, that's it. <laughs> um, so thank you, Brian and Janet, um, uh, for introduction, as well as laying down the foundation for the talk um, that hopefully we'll have in here. Um, and like Janet mentioned, I am an immunologist, and I work on training your own immune system so that it can fight cancer on its own. So imagine the future wherein you don't have to rely on taking drugs to treat cancers. And to do this, believe it or not, we use viruses. Viruses that infect you, get you sick. So let me just ask a simple question. In last six months, year, how many of you got some kind of infection? Within a year, within two years, three years, four years, right? Okay, so you remember that feeling, you know, runny nose, headaches, chills. Did you enjoy it? <laughs> Not really. So most of the times when we think about these infections, we don't really think really good things. It's always associated with some type of disease condition. But today, I'm going to tell you a story, maybe that will change your perspective on how these pathogens can be used as modern day medicines, okay? So, just like every story should start, once upon a time, <laughs> not so in a distant past, there was a surgeon named William Coley. And it is a true story about how 
modern medicines around these pathogens came about. So William Coley was a recent graduate, and just like every other recent graduate, very enthusiastic, very passionate about his medical practice, and he thought that he could cure cancer patients by just doing the surgeries. But as soon as he started his practice, he soon realized that he could amputate the part that had cancer on it, but that patient would still die from cancer. And we are talking about late 18th century or the beginning of the 20th century. So you're, you're talking about 100 years ago, 120 years ago. So of course he was disappointed, disheartened, and he said there has to be something more for this cancer treatment. So you can imagine back then cancer was almost a death sentence. If you had it, we only had so many different options to really treat it. So being a surgeon, there was no other facility. So he went on to become his own cancer researcher, just like what I do. Right? And what he figured out right away within first few years of his discovery is that if he had a patient, if he did a surgery on that patient, and if that wound got infected, that patient did well. And to his astonishment, what he did, he prepared a soup of bacteria and intentionally injected in cancers. And guess what? He could cure patients by just doing that. But you have to remember, this is 100 years ago when there was no antibiotic. So you can imagine, you're playing with fire. You're giving patient bacteria. There is no way you can control it. And those were the reasons that, and at that time, we also didn't understand our body really well. We didn't know how everything worked in our body and everything. So some of his patients, they died during that treatment. And of course, he was shut down. So this otherwise amazing line of discovery, which could have given us new cancer therapeutics back then, it was shut down almost 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Now, fast forward 120 years. In 2015, three years ago, Food and Drug, FDA, Food and Drug Administration from states, they approved the first live infectious virus to be used as a cancer medicine for treatment of melanoma. So this is now reality. We know that these pathogens, these viruses, these bacteria can be used as modern medicine. And in our lab, we have now figured out how these medicines work. We know that these viruses, what we call them the oncolytic viruses, cancer killing viruses, oncolytic, these viruses can kill cancers by two different methods. One, they are able to kill cancers on their own. But the second most important thing that we have discovered in a lab is why those coli's bacterial soups used to work in the first place, 100 years ago. We have figured out that these viruses, these pathogens, you can use them to train your immune system that your immune system now starts acting on its own, identifies that cancer, and can kill it successfully. And we have figured out that not only that it kills your existing cancer, but it can also maintain the protection over a long term, because most of the times, what you hear about people undergoing cancer treatment, cancer relapse, right? So if you have something in your body that is almost like a vaccinated individual, or it is a drug that stays with you as long as you stay healthy and active, wouldn't that be wonderful? So those pathogens, those are able to do that for you, and that's the future of the cancer medicines. 
So in our lab, right now, we are pursuing various means of what we call the personalized medicine or precision medicine, wherein you use these viruses to train your immune system so that you can kill whatever cancer cells that are there, or you can establish the protection so that you don't get that cancer in the future so, there, there, so that there is no relapse. Or the future, the dream is that we actually develop the new immunotherapies so that we stop these cancers from developing in the first place. So hopefully, next time when your nose is running, <laughs> maybe say to your thanks to your, these uninvited pathogens. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to continue the story, um, or the storytelling, um, but I'm going to start a little bit more recently than 100 years ago. I'm actually starting in 1986, um, where there was a very important birth, um, certainly in my field of health promotion, that took place in Ottawa um, on, in that year, um, and it was the, the birth of the Ottawa Charter. How many of you in the room have heard of the Ottawa Charter? Hmm. Not many of you. <laughs> okay, um, the Ottawa Charter is actually an international charter, so it came out of Ottawa, but it's actually probably um, one of the things, the foundation pieces of health promotion as we know it um, in Canada, and it really underpins the work that I do. The fact that so few of you know about it, um, I think also speaks to, to the challenges that I face in my research um, and many others in, in health promotion around actually getting attention to something that really has the most impact um, on our health and well-being. So the Charter actually recognised that health promotion is the domain of social, economic and environmental ministries. So whenever you think about the funding that we have in our system, um, we really, um, a lot of what actually dictates whether we are healthy or not is in other things outside of the health domain. And in fact, the ministries of health are really treating illness rather than preventing it. Um, so what the Ottawa Charter actually challenged was that we um, uh, invest more money in health promotion um, and that we actually create conditions for healthier populations. Um, and it really held great promise at the time. And one of the things that I think is really important to think about is that um, the goal of the Ottawa Charter when it was set out in 1986 was to achieve health for all by the year 2000. My kids were born in the year 2000. They're 18 years old now. Have we got health for all? Did we have health for all back in the year 2000? No, maybe? <laughs> So um, the answer is, yeah, resounding no, really. Um, actually, what we have seen since that time is sickness care spending double um, over the same time period. Um, and what we have seen is actually investment in health promotion, the very thing that the Ottawa Charter was talking about, um, has flatlined. Less than 5% of the health care budget, sickness care budget, really, goes to treating, um, it goes to uh, population health or health promotion. Um, we've seen our provincial sickness care budget um, actually uh, almost uh, consume almost half of the available budget. And what that does is it squeezes out all those other things that we know are important uh, for a civilized society, things like education, for example, housing, having a safe physical environment to actually do the things that we know are important for our health. And chronic diseases and other illnesses are now costing our Canadian economy approximately $190 billion annually um, and account for around 58% of those annual um, sickness care spending that we have. So the Ottawa Charter, 33 years old now, um, so middle-aged maybe, um, is still very, very relevant to the way that um, we fund sickness care and the way that we um, actually live our lives. We've just heard from Shashi about cancer, um, something that's very close to my heart. Uh, I've already had it. I will likely get it again. And actually, one in two of us in this room um, and, and, and elsewhere, one in two of us will develop cancer in our life's lifetime. That's, that's the way it is, unfortunately. But did you know that 40%, 40% of all cancer cases could be prevented. 
That's huge. And the way that we can prevent it is by eating healthy, being active, living smoke-free. More behaviours than that, but those are the three I'm going to focus on today. Um, we also know that um, uh, heart disease and stroke is likely to kill many of us. About 80% of, um, uh, of, ho of our hospitalizations are for that. Um, but we could, uh, sorry, um, um, a large number of our hospitalizations are for that. But 80% of heart disease and stroke could be prevented. Do you know what by? Diet. Healthy eating, <laughs> being active, smoke living smoke-free. Same risk factors for, for cancer also shared by uh, heart disease and stroke. Same things that we could all be doing better at, at, uh, in terms of our behaviours. Yet, um, when we actually look at who is eating healthy, being active and living smoke-free, it's a bit of a depressing picture. Fewer than 5% of us are actually able to achieve all the behaviours at the same time that we would need to be healthy. That's, again, another thing that I spend a lot of my time worrying about. Because essentially, what this means is that healthy behavior, healthy eating, being active, living smoke-free, is abnormal. It's abnormal behavior. Think about that for a minute. Um, and our modern environment is actually encouraging that. It's encouraging us to do the opposite behaviors of the things that we should be doing to prevent our risk of chronic disease and to actually um, you know, achieve our best health prevent potential. Um, and we can't keep putting money into the system to fix those problems when they've started. We have to invest in prevention, and that's what I spend my time doing. Um, we can't keep ignoring what we heard from the Ottawa Charter uh, 33 years ago. And so where better to start that behavior change than in schools? And that's where I focus on um, primarily now. Um, this, schools are an important setting um, because they actually provide a protected space, somewhere our kids can learn um, and, uh, and understand about healthy eating, being active, living smoke-free, um, in, in an environment that's actually very supportive. And we also know that if we were to support the health and learning of our children and youth, that it has a stunning return on investment. Those of you who play the stock market, I think would probably be really happy with a $13 return on investment for every dollar that you invest. That's what we get when we actually help kids to, be, uh, to achieve their, learning, their health and learning potential in schools. And in here in Nova Scotia, we're actually the perfect social laboratory um, for, for that kind of work to happen, because we're small enough, but we've also got a, a, a population that is, that is um, big enough to test these things out and actually scale them up. And in fact, Nova Scotia has been uh, a leader in many of these things that we're talking about here um, in the school system. Nova Scotia has implemented health promoting schools model um, in the school system for a number of years. But unfortunately, what my research has found is that we're not implementing those um, principles at the dose required for the changes that we want to see. So there are some school communities that do this really, really well, and there are some school communities where they do it less well, if not poorly. So what we're really looking at with the work that I'm doing is actually trying to get the dose of change required. Um, and that requires what we call um, systems change. So I'm not trying to influence individual behavior as much as I'm trying to influence the, the behavior of the system so that the systems actually work together to, Im to improve the health and learning of children. Um, and so when I talk about this, I'm really talking about something that we've known for decades, um, but it's not actually happening, and it's why it's not happening that I'm really interested in, in, in changing. Um, so my colleague, Camille Hancock-Friesen, um, she's a cardiac surgeon who um, currently works uh, in Texas, but when I knew her, she was in Nova Scotia. Um, Camille and I got together because she was really seeing the, um, the challenges that um, our children face. Uh, she operating on kids who were actually showing the first signs of heart disease in, in um, childhood. Um, and we now see diseases of adulthood. I learned about maturity onset diabetes when I was in my training um, because we didn't ever see type 2 diabetes in anybody under 40. 
And now we see diagnosis of uh, type 2 diabetes in children um, and increasing numbers year in, year out. We now know that our children actually probably could have a, sh a shorter life expectancy than, our, than their parents. Um, and I think that's, again, a very problematic um, thing to be dealing with. Um, and so Camille and I got together because we really wanted to sort of see about making change. And we worked within the school system to make that change through a program called Heart Healthy Kids. Um, and what we did with that is we actually trained the students themselves to be the change agents within that school, their school community, to be the ones who led physical activity and healthy eating initiatives within the school system. Um, and what that then really planted the seeds for um, what then became Uplift, um, which is where um, we are today with the funding that we just received from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, as Janet noted, we were the, we're the first um, um, we're the first people in Nova Scotia to actually leverage that funding, um, and we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation, the QE2 Foundation, the IWK Foundation, and Dalhousie Advancement for coming together um, for the first time as well to actually help fundraise for us to get the matching private sector funds that we we want and need to leverage that funding. Moving forward, we're actually going to be in the school systems um, in September. In fact, I just came from a meeting um, to, to come here today uh, with our key partners who uh, are all um, really working together to help move this forward and to really create healthier generations for um, the children and youth of this province. Thank you. No, I'm okay. Thank you. It, it's crazy, isn't it? Like, we do this as a job. You'd think I'd be a bit more relaxed about speaking in front of a few people in the room, you know. Um, uh, I'm Daniel Boyd, and I'm a material scientist, and I get really excited about materials. It's like, it's, it's my daughter's in the audience. She can testify to this. I get excited about, I'm not joking, about, like, the plastics we use to mass-produce lunchboxes, right? I get excited about more sophisticated materials. I get excited about the kinds of ceramics that we use for space exploration. But there's, there's one material above all others that I just absolutely love. There is one material that has captivated my thoughts for as long as I can remember. And it's a material that has some of the most unique and transformative capabilities that mankind could ever harness. It's a material that if we study it and learn it properly, we have got the capacity to take on some of the largest challenges in clean energy, in clean water, in communications, and in healthcare. The material I'm talking about is glass, and it is an amazing material. It, it blows my mind. There's 80 elements on the periodic table that I could make a glass from. If I run some basic math on that, that tells me there's about 10 to the 300 formulations of glass possible. That number makes no sense. I don't care how long you've studied science. It's so big, <laughs> it makes no sense, right? So I tried to find a way to make sense of it. Here's a statement for you. It doesn't make much sense either, but it's the best I've got. <laughs> if I had one billion people making one billion glasses every second, it would take the life of our son to make one sample of each glass that's possible. It's like... So that's my Lego playset, and I get to play with it every day in the Faculty of Dentistry. So it's a limitless material, it's full of magic, and it's full of inspiration from art to medicine. And I've spent about 17 years of my life now studying glass, learning about it, learning from it, being frustrated by it, hating it sometimes, and loving it always. Uh, really, it's like another partner to me, to be honest. Um, <laughs> But I'm always seeking to find ways to unleash the power of glass to treat patients, period. That is why I exist as a professional, and it's why I do what I do as a professional. When I came to Dal in 2010, I was hellbent, and I mean hellbent, on finding a way to create tiny little microspheres about the size of table salt. You know, if you can imagine table salt sprinkled on a kitchen table, just pick up one of those tiny little pieces, about that size. Tiny little microspheres that could be implanted in a minimally invasive way into cancers and other malformations in the body. Microspheres that 
could block blood flow into tumors. I wanted to make microspheres that could degrade in the patient's body. And as they degraded, they released the same things they were made from. But the things they were made from were like little secret agents, small elements and ions that can walk right through a cell membrane, go straight to the heart of a cancer cell, and cause it to self-destruct. Thanks to the support from the faculties of dentistry, medicine, engineering, and science, we've realized all of those ideas. We've realized all of them. And today there's a company called ABK Biomedical that's taking some of those breakthrough technologies to the market. That company has manufacturing, research, and commercial operations across North America. And last month, that company closed a record-breaking round of investment for Atlantic Canada of 40 million US dollars. That technology and that raise was done in partnership with one of the world's largest radiation oncology companies. And we're now working with some of the biggest cancer centers on the planet to advance those technologies. Technologies that unleash, totally unleash, the power of glass for the betterment of human health. Technologies that were conceived through basic science with undergraduate, graduate, and professional students on the fourth floor of the dentistry building just across the hall. Those technologies are now being developed for mass production and use all around the world. And we are not just partnered with people who want to sell products. We're partnered with regulators. We're partnered with insurers. We're partnered with patient groups. We're partnered with oncology companies. We have partnered with the world's best to take those technologies through to the market. But I'll be honest, we haven't even started. Like, we just, we haven't even got started yet. Uh, so now I'm hell-bent on something else. <laughs> uh, I'm really hell-bent on finding ways to unlock the body's own power of self-repair and regeneration. And I believe that glass can offer us a way to do some of that. We're now actively engaging in research where we can use glass to treat the pain associated with osteoarthritis without the need for a drug. No joke, right? I didn't think that might be possible two years ago. And then I was speaking with a person who was responsible for the globalization of several drugs on behalf of AstraZeneca, and he wants to take this technology from Dow now to commercialize it immediately for clinical use. That technology is to treat osteoarthritis. You know, there's a diagnosis of osteoarthritis every 60 seconds in Canada. I mean, it's, it's, and it's all the same risk factors that Sarah has talked about here. There's a diagnosis of osteoarthritis every 60 seconds in Canada. And do you know how much it's going to cost us over the next 30 years? About 433 billion bucks on pain management. That's like, it's ridiculous. That's not even sustainable, right? I shouldn't have a job because we should be listening to people like Sarah, but we're not, <laughs> right? But that's, but that's the reality, right? And because we're slow to move and because we're not paying attention to voices like Sarah's in any proper way, and thankfully that's changing thanks to Sarah's work, numbers like 433 billion get printed in documents about how much the taxpayer is going to pay on pain management for osteoarthritis. So we made a glass technology that can take out those pain receptors in an osteoarthritic knee and help around 7 million people a year in North America every year. We're making it so that these glass particles can give the quality of life back to patients that osteoarthritis so cruelly robs from them. Glass is helping us fight back for those patients. And now we're making glasses that can do lots of other things. We're making glasses that can regenerate teeth, treat simple things like dentin hypersensitivity, Glasses that can interact with bacteria to treat global problems in dentistry like caries. Caries, right? Which has massive global impact. There are right now, take a breath, 2.61 billion people on this planet with untreated caries. And it affects them so much. 621 million of those are children. It's just not good enough. Period, right? And we got to do things like population outreach, health promotion, and we got to work on ways to prevent those types of diseases and treat them as they arise. Glass is helping us with that. So we're exploring glasses now that can kill drug-resistant bacteria. We're making glasses that can stop bacteria forming large colonies that could be used in dentistry and medicine more broadly. 
We are asking ourselves every day, what can we do to unleash the power of glass to deal with some of the most pressing challenges in human healthcare? Uh, my name is Daniel Boyd, and I am so proud to be a glass scientist, and I am so proud to be an associate professor at the Faculty of Dentistry here at Dalhousie. Thanks for listening. Uh, that's great. To maintain symmetry, I'm going to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and to maintain symmetry, I'm going to tell you a hundred year story. <laughs> anyway, you saw an excitable inorganic chemist. <laughs> now you're going to listen from uh, an excitable organic chemist. <laughs> Eh? to maintain symmetry once again. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I, I'm a neurologist, and I uh, primarily, my subspecialty is seeing patients with, uh, with dementia. And it's a, it's, a, it's a huge problem, as you can imagine. As you know, United Nations and World Health Organization, which was formed in 1930s, every year when they put out uh, a document about the problems that, are, that affect the majority of the people in the world, I mean, that's their, their business to bring to the attention and address issues that, address, that affect the majority of the people in the world. And over the years, they have been putting out these documents where they say HIV is a big thing, malaria, cholera, those are the things that kill most of the people and, in the world. And uh, about two or three years ago, they put out a document telling the nations of the world, dementia is a problem. And if you don't address dementia, you'll be bankrupt. And this is the first time the United Nations or the World Health Organization put out a document like that about dementia. So dementia is not a very difficult condition to diagnose because if somebody has a cognitive problems, memory problems that affect with the activities of daily living, that's why they go and see the physician, etc. That person has dementia, cognitive problems, memory, etc. They affect with activities of daily living. But there are many uh, forms of dementia, and Alzheimer's disease is one of them. And when I see people, and you can look at the literature about all the, uh, uh, all the clinics that see patients with uh, dementia, you can be 80% sure, 90, 95% sure that it's Alzheimer's disease, for example, but never 100% sure. And that is the problem, because in order to be 100% sure, you have to wait for somebody with dementia to die to look at the, uh, at the brain to make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Well, that is just not good enough. Because if you look at over the last uh, many years, the only uh, uh, drugs that we have right now to treat symptoms of Alzheimer's disease were discovered 20 years ago. It, it does not affect uh, the course of the disease, it particularly it affects the symptoms. We have no cure. And not finding a cure for Alzheimer's disease and dementia is not an option because a lot of people are having problems like this, you see. And what are the problems here? If you look at over the last 10 years, you want big numbers? If you look at the last 10 years, over 200 clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease have failed. That's huge. That's a lot of money. So the question is, why are these clinical trials failing? People are not stupid, you know? These targets are well thought out, etc. right? But there is a problem in that if you are not able to diagnose Alzheimer's disease as precisely as you can, then it becomes problematic. So if you look at people uh, with Alzheimer's disease. What do they have in their brain? They have cognitive problems, and if you look under the brain, under the microscope, they have these proteins called plaques and tangles. And you say, somebody who has got cognitive impairment, which I think is Alzheimer's disease, you look under the microscope, you see plaques and tangles, that's Alzheimer's disease. That was described 100 years ago by Alzheimer. Somebody else actually described it prior to that. We won't get into controversy here. So <laughs> Alzheimer's disease was described by Alzheimer as we know today. So you look at plaques and tangles. But if you look at the Nun study, who has heard of the Nun study? Some of you have. So the Nun study was a longitudinal study where scientists 20, 30 years ago uh, went to a monastery in the United States and asked these nuns whether they would participate in this longitudinal study where they examined these nuns <clears throat> every year, did cognitive testing and every test you can imagine, and they asked them to have a look at the brain when they died. They don't donate the brains. And if you look at these brain tissues, there are people who died who are cognitively totally devastated. They look at the brain and they're plaques and tangles. And then you have other individuals who died around the same age, and you look under the brain, and they have plaques and tangles just like the other person. So what is going on? 
That is the difficult part, you see? So very clever people of some years ago said, well, you know, if plaques and tangles are required to make a diagnosis, so let's look at a patient. We say, this is dementia, and let's look, uh, make molecules that go and bind to the amyloid, and let's do a PET scan. And it worked. It worked. So right now, you can you know, go to states and you can have a PET scan done for amyloid and it will be positive. The problem is these non study and many other studies have shown that about 20 to 30% of cognitively normal people have plaques and tangles. That's the difficulty, right? So, you know, they have the story of Sister Martha and Sister Agnes, you know, from the monastery. And, you know, one of them and I, I had clearly dementia, the other one didn't. And the one you didn't, and you looked at the you know, PET scan, and you say, oh, Sister Agnes, you know what? You're 95 years old. You have preclinical Alzheimer's disease. You're going to get Alzheimer's disease. Sister Agnes is going to tell you to go suck a lemon, right? <laughs> because she doesn't care. You know, what is that? You know, so this is one of the problems that we, that we have. So, so 100 years ago, Alzheimer looked after a patient. She was in her 50s, and she had cognitive and behavioral problems. And when she died, Alzheimer was in a, in a, in a, condi in a, in a milieu in Munich where people were looking at how to preserve brains, how to stain brains, missile, and all those big names, you know, were there. And so when this lady died, Alzheimer was in the right place at the right time. He was able to preserve and examine this brain. And he saw that in the brain there were these plaques and tangles. That is what we now know as Alzheimer's disease, right? Cognitive behavioral problems that has plaques and tangles. So he looked at the brain tissues, you see? If you fast forward 80 years, people are still looking at the brain tissues, but with new technology, new reagents, et cetera, et cetera. And we realized that there are certain population of brain cells that die. And the drugs that we use today to treat symptoms of Alzheimer's disease were discovered because of that understanding of looking at the brains again. So for us, if we want to de determine what are those targets for diagnosis and for treatment of Alzheimer's disease, you need to look at the brain tissues. So about 25 years ago, Ken Rockwood and I walked over to the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia, and we said we would like to establish a brain bank. Because you can't, you know, there is no satisfactory model of Alzheimer's disease or any, I dare say, human disease. So you have to examine human tissue, right? So we started this uh, with the help of Alzheimer's Society and subsequently with DMRF, we have established a brain bank. I see Debbie back there. She was the first person in the lab who helped us uh, establish that. So over the last 20 years or so, we have had over 1,200 brain tissues donated to the brain bank. And when we started out, I wanted to do research with these brains for my own research. And I realized, well, that's not good. There must be a clever person out there in the world who will find a, uh, 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 the cause and cure for Alzheimer's disease. So we send these brain tissues to anybody in the world. And this is the only one in Eastern Canada that does that. And that is to, through the help of Alzheimer's Society and, uh, and, the, uh, and DMRF. Back to my work. Looking at these brain tissues over the last 20 years, we have found that there's other proteins, and I can, I can go into details later on, in gory details. <laughs> but I won't do that to you. <laughs> anyway, we have found another protein using different uh, methodologies that is a better marker than the amyloid and, tau, and, and neuro, the tau protein that people have traditionally looked at. And so as a chemist, excitable, Organic chemist, <laughs> what? <laughs> Organic chemist. And we have been uh, making molecules that target this particular protein. And we are making these molecules radioactive so that it can be used with a PET scanner or a SPEC scanner. So when somebody comes in, the probability of diagnosing or, or being able to diagnose Alzheimer's disease better is, is far better than using the traditional amyloid plaques uh, or amyloid imaging agents where we know about 20 to 30 percent of normal people have these plaques. So our task is to find a method to properly diagnose Alzheimer's disease during life so that we don't have 200 failed clinical trials as we go forward. Because as I said earlier on, I keep on saying, this is my mantra. Somebody said it somewhere, but I've stolen it. That <laughs> failure to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease is not an option. You know, because we are living longer and the prevalence of this condition is getting longer and longer.
So that's what I do. Thank you very much. I'm really hoping you've got some good questions for these very good speakers. Um, uh, we had a few that were on our minds, and so um, just to get the ball rolling, I'm going to throw some over um, unless I'm overwhelmed by hands going up right this minute. Okay, I'm overwhelmed. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged. I'm positively encouraged. Um, so uh, why don't we uh, throw it to you to ask a question, and then we'll see how it goes. Are you doing um, any work with uh, human subjects right now? Are you doing any trials? Or w yeah. I don't think you mentioned that. No, I didn't. Yeah, 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 thank you for the question. Right now, we're, we are at the preclinical stages because we have determined that some of the molecules that we have made that target this particular protein is able to distinguish normal brain from, al from Alzheimer in a, in a, in a, mo in a model in the preclinical stages. So we, what we need to do is whenever, the, you know, this is chemistry, you know, uh, when you find a target and you find a lead compound, you have to make it now better based on what we know right now. So we need to be able to make molecules that uh, uh, bind better to this particular mo molecule, they cross the blood-brain barrier. You know, the, the, uh, the brain is a privileged organ. You know, it doesn't like stuff to go in it that it doesn't like. So we have to make molecules so it says, yeah, that's okay, you can come in, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so we have to make it a little bit better than that. So we're not there yet in the human trials yet. We're at the preclinical stages right now. Dr. Gujar, uh, you mentioned uh, using viruses to cure cancer, but I wasn't clear on whether you inject the virus directly into the cancer or is it a systemic treatment? And if it is systemic, do you foresee at some point having uh, childhood inoculations the same as you do now for MMR that would include cancer? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. And that's, that's a great question. Um, right now, we can use both the ways to target cancer. Um, so let's say, for example, somebody has melanoma, I mean, which is accessible cancer. Uh, you can inject right in cancer. And that way, you are delivering that virus right where cancer cells are. But then you could also have cancers that are not accessible for direct injections. In those cases, so let's say, for example, you have something inside your body that is already diagnosed, you can give via blood. So just like if you go in clinic and you have uh, saline given to you or any drugs that are given through IV, uh, your virus can also be given uh, via bloodstream so that now it reaches your cancer cells and then it starts killing. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of the question? Do you see it being a childhood uh, vaccination? Right. So I in terms of vaccinations, cancer, uh, the, the cancer vaccines, <coughs> yes, that could be a possibility of the future where you are giving people or you're training people's immune system for different type of cancers. Right, and then we are working on one of the really exciting project in collaboration with DMIF right now, that we have figured out a signature, or we are figuring out the signature of each cancer that is distinct from your normal cell, right? Because if you think about it, your cancer is no different than your normal cell. It is just a deviation of what you have. So if, let's say, for example, you talked about skin cancer, it comes from your healthy skin. Right? So then you have to figure out what is it that makes my cancer different from my normal tissue. Once you have that identifier, then you can use that to create your vaccine. And that's what we are doing. And so far, it hasn't been possible because the technologies were not there. Right? So now we can actually make those identification, put those in vaccine preps, and those preps can be used to do uh, the vaccinations. So hopefully that's the future of cancer treatment where you can actually use these vaccines so that people are immunized for certain types of cancers. Thank you, Shashi. We have another question over here. Thank you. Um, this question's for uh, Danny and sort of Sarah, uh, perhaps. Um, so my question is just around the osteoarthritis uh, area. Um, and it's really exciting because we know that NSAIDs have 
uh, significant problems as well as we've got lots of issues around using um, opioid uh, um, uh, drugs for, uh, for uh, osteoarthritis. But we know that osteoarthritis has both a structural and a, a symptomatic component to it. Um, and I guess my, my question is we uh, just, it's almost trying to look at what the balance is because we know that actually physical activity is one of the best ways to improve pain in individuals who have um, osteoarthritis. Um, and we also know that when we um, actually direct a therapy at the pain, um, oftentimes people end up doing things that actually are not good for the structural component of the disease. Um, and I'm just uh, just trying to figure out, like, uh, I think it's kind of marrying these two approaches uh, <laughs> because we know that less than, like, that 68% of people who have osteoarthritis think that physical activity is uh, bad for them. Um, and people just like to have the silver bullet. They just want it to be gone. Uh, and I, I j I'm just trying to think about, like, from uh, physical activity is not really a dynamic type of, 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 of thing, whereas a, a drug or, a, a, you know, something that can take something away easily. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on, like, what the balance is. We'll definitely share this in some way for sure. Um, I gotta, I'll be brief in terms of the backstory. Uh, it's been contended for decades that osteoarthritis has a particular pathophysiology and it's not been very well reflected or accepted in the literature until there was some work published in some really high profile journals a few years back, including Nature. And then all of a sudden everyone's like, oh, well, it's in Nature, it must be true then. And finally, after decades of work, patient work in the UK, people have now recognized some pathophysiological changes in an osteoarthritic joint, right? And Cheryl is correct in that if you think about the distribution of people who have pain from osteoarthritis, you've got people at the start of the curve, if it's a big curve, right? You've got people at the start of the curve who've got pain, but it can be managed with very simple and effective treatments like non anti-inflammatories. And then we got people at the whole other end of the spectrum who are in so much pain, their quality of life is in pieces, and they're on a waiting list to get on a waiting list to get on the waiting list to have their knees replaced. And then we have everyone else in the middle whose quality of life is really deteriorating fast. Their physical activity is starting to be compromised. They get into a vicious loop where they stop exercising, the pain gets worse, they start to get obese, there's more weight on the joints, Activity goes down and it's just on and on, this continuous progression. But I'll come back to the pathophysiology. It's been recognized that in osteoarthritic joints, there are abnormal formations of blood vessels that shouldn't be present in, some of these in a lot of these osteoarthritic joints, over 80% of them. And those abnormal blood vessels bring pain receptors to that site that should not be there, which leads to pain, which leads to patients referring for pain, right? but there's very little options for their treatment in the middle. So a group of Japanese doctors blocked the blood vessels that were feeding those pain receptors. And they use a drug that was engineered to kill resistant bacteria called Promoxin. And they blend Promoxin with a contrast in the clinic and it makes these tiny little globules that degrade. And it's the best they got. And they injected these particles to block the blood flow into the vessels feeding all these pain receptors. And patients' pain scores plummeted. 45-minute procedure, they go from the highest pain scores to the lowest, and they stay low for three years at least, and we're only three years into the study right now. The doctors finished that first publication by saying, it'd be real nice if we didn't have to use this bloody drug because using a drug like that for a condition like this it's just not been engineered for it. It's very inappropriate, but it's giving pain relief. Be real nice if someone could make a small particle. <laughs> I'm not joking. Be real, be real nice if there was someone out there who knew how to make a small particle that would block blood flow in a vessel. Um, 
and then and then they said it'd be nicer still if they could just make it degrade so that it's not going to come out of that vessel and do more damage. Um, so I did what I do. I asked someone for <laughs> I asked someone for a few quid to see if I could make a prototype, and we made it. And I gave it to a clinical specialist in Montreal, and I said, "Just use it. Just tell me if it's good. I don't need you to tell me it's good. Just tell me if this is something worth spending my time on." He called me back, and he's like, "We got to do something with this." So. So then I called a guy in Philadelphia and I said, right, I trust you, you work for AstraZeneca, you've worked for 30 years in drug development, I need to know if this is something that really would help patients. I don't want to be in the room, these are the questions I'd like you to ask or probe. And that guy interviewed, I don't know, like lots and lots and lots of doctors from East Coast to West Coast, top of Canada to bottom of America. And uh, he came back and he's like, time is of the essence here. We got to get this out as soon as we can and we got to get it moving as quickly as possible because the benefit of that procedure isn't just for the patient, it turns out. It's obviously for the patient first. But if you get a corticosteroid injection in your knee, it might last three months if you're lucky. Insurers hate that because it costs a lot every three months while someone's waiting to get on the waiting list to get on the waiting list to get on the waiting list, <laughs> right? So, so that's a problem. So... We've got something now that can help insurers because it's cheaper. It'll help hospitals because it's very fast. It'll help doctors because they get compensated very well for doing these procedures. And it provides effective pain relief for three to five years, which will get people back to moving, hopefully, and get their pain levels down. I'll stop there and hand it back to Sarah. Well, yeah, and I would just say it would be even better if we actually prevented it in the first <laughs> place. <laughs> um, yeah, but when 15% of, um, only 15% of, of Canadians are active enough, um, I believe that's the, uh, um, yeah, are meeting current physical activity recommendations. So there's a lot of work to do to get people moving more often. Um, and uh, I'm very conscious that I'm saying that as we've all been sitting for a, over <laughs> an hour. <laughs> Um, while you have the mic, I've got a question uh, for you, Sarah. What, w in your uh, mind, what is unique about the Nova Scotia research ecosystem? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, I'm not even sure if I know an answer to that. I think part of it is that we are small enough to get things done, um, but still big enough to make an impact. And I think that's, for me, um, what's been the real benefit of being here. I talked about, um, you know, the, the, the province as a bit of a social laboratory. Um, I've also, I think, just heard from, from my colleagues just um, how easy it is to get things done here. Um, and um, from my perspective as well, I, I can walk down the hill and walk back up again, of course, <laughs> um, to see policymakers very easily um, and we have the hospitals like literally on our doorstep so I think there's something about our particularly in, in Halifax we do have that really kind of a very um, a very collaborative environment to do this kind of work and only getting more so actually. Thank you would you hand that down to Sultan and um, while I have the mic and I promise I'll I, do I see any I see somebody up oh good okay all right, let's go. Hold your hand up. I'll get back to your phone. Please stand by. Dr. Kirk, I, th I think the work you're doing is really important. Most government spending is designed to improve or maintain health, yet despite the fact that we're so small and we can get lots done, it's ineffective. In your opinion, why is it so ineffective? And one example is the fact that private schools, which cost less per student than public schools, are more effective at maintaining healthy children. Uh, that's a really, really great question. I think there's something about our culture um, within uh, the Atlantic region not just around Nova Scotia. Um, there's something to do with, uh, again, just the priorities that we set for our children. So math and literacy are major um, priorities. Um, what our research has found that when kids are healthy and nourished and active, their math and literacy scores will actually improve. Um, so we already know again. So it, it's not for lack of knowledge. Um, ironically, we have, the, we have all the knowledge that we need. Um, uh, I think part of the challenge within our region is, is people competing for very limited resources. So we're all fighting for the money and we don't always work 
collaboratively. And that's one of the things that Uplift has really um, worked hard to do is actually bring those different players together. So we are actually working with the three key systems that are, that are um, responsible for the health of our kids, the Department of Health and Wellness, the Department of Education, and the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and helping them to work better together um, to address that, but absolutely, I think that's been the real challenge. Is you know we're, you know sometimes we're not actually um, really working for our own best interests. Um, my question's for Dr. Gujar. So you explained what your research is about injecting oncolytic viruses into the cancer cells. And would you be expecting similar outcomes in patients who are immune compromised and have a history of various autoimmune disorders and have a current ongoing episode of cancer? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question. Um, so to, the first, uh, answer, to, to answer your first part of the question, um, the, so far, uh, the worldwide, oncolytic viruses have been used for multiple different types of cancers. Almost you can name it and it, it works well. One of the best experiences that we have had so far using oncolytic viruses in people is that we haven't had almost any really, really bad side effects because that is one of the things people always look out for when, when we're developing a new drug because most likely if somebody's undergoing cancer therapy, you can tell by just looking at them, right? Like either they would be so weak, most probably they have lost their hair, or, or, or they just what we call like a sick look at, right? So that's, we know that these drugs are not really doing any benefit to their health or their overall health. So what we have seen so far is that in immunocompetent hosts especially, the drug is very well tolerated. So you can imagine we have a mouse that is usually 25 grams, right, tiny individual. We can put, um, in terms of virus particles, 10 to the 8 particles in that mouse and it is still alive, right? So the, the virus is well tolerated and, and it goes after cancer cells very selectively. So if you are a if you are a patient who has active immune system, you got no trouble. Now going to your second question, whether it could induce the autoimmune diseases in um, individuals who may be a little bit immunocompromised. So far, we haven't seen anything really substantial to support that. That being said, the research is still on the go because any time when we try to target anything related to cancer, it is so close to your normal self, there is always that possibility that something could get initiated that also targets your normal self. But so far, like I said, you know, the, the one of the projects that we are working on, we are, we are going after really eight to 11 amino acid long peptides that differentiate your cancer cell versus your normal cell. So you are, you are minimizing that chance of autoreactivity even further and further so that hopefully when you go forward in a few years, what we will have is combination of these small, small molecules that only happen in cancer so that it is not producing any side effects in your normal cells. So that, that, that's the uh, reason so that we can avoid any possible autoimmune disorders uh, while giving this treatment. We have time for just a few more questions. Over here and then up there. Great. Um, hello, my name is Maria. Uh, thank you for everything today. And I just have the uh, same uh, kind of topic of interest uh, to um, ask a question, um, Dr. Gujar, about um, the viruses that are being in, um, injected into the uh, cancer patient. Um, don't they um, get fired off by the immune system in within two weeks or so? Yes. And uh, how, how do you go from there? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. If you're looking for a job, we have a job in the lab. <laughs> 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 because that's, 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 that's very uh, um, obvious and very uh, good question. Because the question is that, yes, 
you can use viruses to target cancers, but before your virus can do any good against your cancer, what happens is as soon as you put your virus in your body, your body starts identifying your virus, and then it goes after virus before it can do its good deeds, right? So what, now we know that we can play that game with virus and cancer in a way that you use your virus as a tool to get your immune system going, right? So because once you can get your virus to train your immune system, which usually takes seven days, if that immunization or if that training happens, you don't need that virus anymore. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys like a you know, very simple example what we did uh, just to explain that. We, we did a very simple experiment, right? So we, if you take a mouse or if you take any host and if you have that, if you, that, that host has a cancer, if you treat that cancer with real virus, right? And the idea is that now, okay, now immune system is trained. If you take immune cells from that host and put into second host now and try to give that host cancer, will not happen. That tells you that once your immune system is trained, you don't need, because the, the second host didn't get any virus. It only got your immune cells. So once you train that immune system, you don't need that virus anymore. So going forward, that's the idea that these viruses, these pathogens, these will be used to train your immune system. We are not even looking at their capacity to kill the cancer cells on their own. It is a tool to get your immune system going so that you don't need them anymore because you don't want to have virus in your body for the rest of your life anyways, right? And you want a treatment that happens in a small window of time, and then after that, you are protected by your own defenses. Right, so that's where the research is right now, that how do we implement, how do we use these viruses so that we can figure out different ways so that you can train your immune system and now you are okay on your own because now your immune defenses are, because you can imagine, most of us, we got immunization when we were kids, right? And you never got those diseases, right? So if you really figured out a successful way of immunizing or teaching your body, that's the holy grail of, of treating this cancer in a natural, organic way where you don't have to rely on the drugs. And that would be the cancer immunotherapy. Thank you. Hi, uh, and thank you very much for the presentations. They're amazing. But I guess this one for Dr. Sharon, whoever wants to uh, jump in. Uh, in terms of, I guess, health promotion, I suppose you're kind of speaking to the choir with everyone in this room who's educated and who's already bought into these treatments. Um, do you foresee like a difficulty in the future and actually we're kind of facing it now, I suppose, with you know, various movements of uh, you know, anti-vaccinations so back into the conversation and, and uh, in terms of, say, using your own immune system and viruses to treat cancers, it kind of lends down the same pathway. Uh, in terms of like public engagement and even, even people that, and parents of these children that are maybe not so educated, do you find you're having more difficulty or do you have any tips or anything along those lines, I guess, on a primary care level or practitioner level? That's a really great question. And actually, um, our secret weapon, I think, is the kids themselves. Um, when you have children, um, and what we heard in, for example, in the, when we were doing a, the H2K project, um, teaching kids about physical activity in the school, and one of the children said, um, you know, my dad's a smoker, and he has um, promised to quit smoking if I can run around this field however many times, you know, <laughs> that is, you know, and we've seen this with children, um, children and youth, um, if we can get them um, engaged and motivated around something, we've seen this with climate change, which we're seeing very, you know, that, that conversation now, we've seen it with recycling, um, and we did actually have also seen it with things like um, smoking in cars as well, so I think that that is our, our opportunity, and particularly with Uplift, that's a, a big focus of, of Uplift is actually, um, is, in, is, engaging the youth and, and training the youth, if you like, to be leaders um, in health promotion and taking that message back to the community. Um, and I'll give you another little example. I mean, this is a, some, you know, again, my, my children are now 18, but when my son was in grade five, and, you know, this is the, the work that I do, um, uh, we have a school food nutrition policy, for example, that was in, in since 2006, um, but it has been consistently undermined um, by everybody, <laughs> not just parents, but, um, but, you know, many people fundraising with unhealthy food still happens. 
Um, and uh, my son came home and he said, well, mum, we're having a bake sale. And um, I said, oh, well, let's do, you know, granola parfait, you know, yogurt and stuff, you know. And he went, oh, mum, don't do something too healthy because I'll be the only one that does. <laughs> That's what I mean by things being abnormal. We've got to switch that around. And as I say, I think the kids are the way, way to do that. We have one final question up there at the top, Joanne. Danny, I know you're not excited about your research at all, and, and neither am I. Uh, but I, I would really love to hear a little bit about um, your work in women's reproductive health and the use of um, glass in uh, uterine fibroids. As we all know, there's not a ton of research in, in women's health, and I uh, really commend the work you've done there. And I'd like to understand a little bit more about how uh, glass is used in uterine fibroids, what some of the side effects are, and if it's in practice now. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this this whole microsphere story when I came to Dow first and wanting to make microspheres to treat malformations and cancers. We actually started with considering fibroids. They affect a massive percentage of the female population. About 640,000 hysterectomies are going to happen this year in the United States and the principal cause for those hysterectomies will be uterine leomyoma. 80% um, of those patients we estimate are eligible for a minimally invasive treatment. A uterine leomyoma can be as large as a watermelon for some patients or as small as a satsuma or a grape. And you can have many or you can have one. Um, but the uterus is an interesting organ because it gets lots and lots of blood supply from lots and lots of vessels. Uterine fibroids are really hungry for blood and they tend to take their nutrient supply from just one vessel, the silly buggers, <laughs> the uterine artery. So if you can take out the uterine artery, you can stop blood flow to the fibroid, which causes it to shrink and become asymptomatic while maintaining the total patency of the uterus. The catch in doing that is you need a particle that's easily visualized under multimodal diagnostic imaging approaches so that you can see where the particles are distributed, so that you know they're targeting the correct areas, so that you're not gonna do any damage to the uterus. And so we made a particle that is imageable on x-ray, CT, and invisible on MRI, because that's what the doctors wanted, like, thanks so much. Make it visible on everything, <laughs> but invisible on MRI. Right. But anyway, we made it. We got lucky. I wish I could sit, stand here and say, we engineered it, and we know glass so well that we did that. No, we didn't. We, we engineered it, and it was visible on x-ray and CT, and thank goodness it was invisible on MRI. Um, but we made it, and we started that company, ABK, to commercialize that technology. And we have been working with FDA to bring that technology to the market right now, along with a radioactive version to treat primary liver cancer and metastatic colorectal cancer. Uh, I was down with FDA just a few months ago, going through the last pieces of test documentation that they need to see to release it onto the market. So we hope to have that technology launched in the next couple of years, ready to treat lots and lots of patients with fibroids. But it turns out that it's got really cool benefits for gentlemen with prostatic hyperplasia as well. And those gents don't have an awful lot of options. There's lots of meds and things like that available, but it is possible to go in and embolize the prostate just like you'd embolize the uterus and cause the hyperplasia to shrink, which ameliorates symptoms massively. So there's tons, I mean, it's very simple really. It's you're just plugging a sinkhole with peas, right? You just, <laughs> but you gotta, but you gotta find the right vessel and you gotta know that when you're putting a particle there that you can control it, you can see where it's going and that you can monitor it in the patient over time to make sure that the treatment is optimal and personalized to their condition. And, and that's where we're headed next. We now wanna make those things so they degrade. We wanna be able to go in, cause an embolic event, cause ischemia, cause symptom relief, and then have the particles disappear so that the patients don't have to worry about long-term exposure to medical devices. So, um, Sultan, yeah, I'm coming back to you with my okay. question. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I, if you don't want to answer it, if you want to give me another answer to something else, you get the last word. <laughs> um, but here is what I was curious about. Um, can you share with us the impact uh, your people has had? You know, the sort of the, the patient outcome, I, I guess, uh, question. What impact, if any, has your research had on people? If you've got an example of someone who helped to drive your research or, or the importance of um, 
and why it, it has to be focused on the patients. Thank you. Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, your previous question, you know, we are right now at uh, preclinical stages of uh, this uh, technology. And so our hope is that by developing methodologies where we can diagnose people more accurately, that this technology will facilitate clinical trials so that we can get better curative drugs. And I think that is not just true for the work that I do. I think that is true for all the medically related field and any field where if you're able to develop a technology that can diagnose and help with early diagnosis, then uh, it will facilitate uh, finding a cure. So that's, I don't know whether I answered the question, but uh, <laughs> I, I liked it. it. I, li I liked it. Could I just add something Yes, you may, briefly? Danny. Because um, it's a great question, and I often think, like I'm primarily motivated by getting something to the patient to improve the patient's lives. And I kind of didn't realize the impact we can have on people's lives on that journey. It was like, because of those little glass microspheres, there's been about 30 really high paid, fantastic jobs in this region that wouldn't have existed without that research. There's companies coming from California with mergers and acquisitions teams to little old Nova Scotia to take us out for beers to see if they can work with us and talk with us. There's people in university, undergraduate programs, getting training in companies like that locally. It's, I mean, prior to some of this research happening in the last 10 years in this region, People were just leaving. Now we're bringing people. I've, I've recruited people from all over the world to Nova Scotia to come work here, work in my lab at Dollar, work in the companies in the region. So definitely we're motivated to help patients, of course. I just didn't realize how much good you could do along that road as you're going to help those patients. Local research, global impact. Aren't they amazing? They are fabulous. <laughs> So um, how many, show of hands, uh, are in the health professions, either currently or graduated from or alumni? Just, so this is, we're, we're swimming in your lanes here. How many uh, uh, alumni from other faculties are here today? Great, excellent. And then uh, the other category, not health professions, not alumni. You just learned about this and you wanted to come. Anyone? It's wonderful. So um, I just uh, I get to work a lot with um, uh, researchers and health professionals, and um, and I'm just always um, amazed and overwhelmed by their presentations. I especially love it when they present with 500 slides behind them, <laughs> <coughs> and some of those slides make my head hurt because I'm not I'm not one of you. I'm not a health professional or a medical researcher. Um, but I, I just, I just want to say a huge congratulations and thank you to the four of you. You can see why they've been chosen to speak today about local research and global impact. They, you are the best. You are a communicator's dream. <laughs> is what you are. Um, speaking of local and a village, it does take a village. I was um, uh, reminded last night I attended another alumni event uh, put on the, uh, the present presentation, uh, Edward Snowden, who was streamed in to us from Russia. And uh, this is all part of uh, alumni weekend. Uh, it, it, the village that has helped put this together is quite <coughs> huge and hardworking, led by alumni affairs, uh, the team, as well from advancement. We've got folks here from communications and marketing. There are folks here that are doing social media. We've got audiovisual experts. We've been provided catering by Aramark, the Dalhousie Medical Research Foundation team, and there are other volunteers that came forward to help out today. So um, I sure hope I've included everyone, and if not, I, I do apologize, but thank you all for what you did to put on such a great event. All right, well, it looks like I get the last word. Um, and again, so thank you, thank you to all of you. 
Thanks so much, Janet, for freeing your schedule to do this today. You did a fantastic job, and it's, it's been amazing and continues to be amazing working with you. Um, we have something for you and for our uh, four guest speakers today. Um, I want to say that I have the privilege of working with um, these four researchers on the regular, and it is truly amazing the work that's being done right here in our own backyard. Things that we, we, we underplay the magnificence um, and you know the impact of the research that's happening right here. And so it's great for you to, to have come out. And I have to say that you are leaving here uh, changed people because now you are ambassadors for this incredible research that's happening here. So thanks for taking the time to come and see us here today.